Chapter 7 Haphazard, Random, Confusing Messages from Those Not in Physical Bodies Raise More Questions Than They Answer Remember some of the examples we've shared, if it wasn't Rebecca's blood on the sheets, then whose was it? Who or what did Marianne see all those years ago at the foot of her bed? Who or what phoned Barbara, Kate, and Mary? Who or what visited Richard? Who or what managed to provide all those special effects and answers, even though the second stager was locked out of the house during the gross point seance? Who or what announced her name to Kathy and her husband, John? The answer is so simple that most of us find it hard to believe. The only thing we leave behind at death is the physical body. That's all. That's it. The rest of self, our mental, emotional, and spiritual self-awareness, our consciousness, in other words, remains intact. Ghosts, spirits, and apparitions are nothing more, or less, than souls that lack physical bodies to anchor them into what we perceive as the only reality, the physical world. The same applies to all of us before we are born into physical bodies. The soul, in essence, consists of energy. That is why the soul precedes the appearance of a physical body, which itself is energy in material form, and survives its death. There just so happen to be two mathematical equations to express both death and birth creation. The first of these is A equals MC2. Most of us know this is Albert Einstein's famous equation, published in 1905, stating the fundamental equivalence between matter and energy. It can also describe the process we refer to as death if we alter the equation's variables slightly. A still stands for energy, although we will refine the meaning of energy shortly. M still stands for matter. But instead of the speed of light multiplied by the speed of light, the speed of light squared, C2 now stands for the duality of consciousness. And the speed of consciousness is instantaneous, as multiple experiments with the tiniest known particles, called quanta, have demonstrated. It is way beyond the scope of this book to explore all of the very exciting developments in the fields of quantum mechanics and consciousness research. Suffice it to note that the scientific community is moving toward a distinctly metaphysical understanding of the survival of consciousness after death as strings of quanta. One key characteristic of quanta is that they vibrate. Everything that exists, the material, such as the physical body, and the non-material, such as consciousness, vibrates. Every known or theoretical universe vibrates, or else it does not exist. Vibration is the foundation of creation point one for the purposes of the afterlife healing circle, we also need to recognize that whereas the soul is energy, this energy is not the type that science refers to as, the ability to do work. Such a definition applies to material energy in this physical world. Examples of this include steam expanding to drive a piston that turns the wheels of a train engine, or the heat unlocked by burning coal or natural gas that raises the temperature of water until it becomes steam that is, doing work, in the scientific sense. The soul is not about doing work or anything else. The soul is about being. It is about existing instead of not existing. The kind of energy that forms the soul is most accurately defined as the ability to love point to being and self-awareness, or consciousness, originate in love, the ultimate source, also known as God or the divine in most of the world's religions. Divine love is unconditional, meaning it is not limited or hampered by expectations or demands. Thus, it vibrates at the fastest frequency possible at any given instant. It also has many names on earth, Hindus call it prana, the life force, the Chinese long ago named it chi or chi, and Christian westerners refer to it as agape, or divine grace. When we are conducting the afterlife healing circle properly, we are experiencing a magnified, enhanced flow of that unconditional love energy. As we have said already, the feeling is glorious. Now we may reinterpret Einstein's equivalence equation. With our redefined variables, we can see that consciousness accelerates in frequency until it breaks away from matter, the physical body. The physical body dies as a result, and consciousness remains in a state that cannot be detected with our physical senses, much like infrared light, which human eyes cannot see, or infrasound, which human ears cannot hear. If we rearrange these same redefined variables, we can develop an equation to show the process we know as birth, or creation. Matter, such as a physical body, appears when consciousness acts to slow the vibrational frequency of soul energy. The answer to the question, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, is neither. Energy comes first, and provides the blueprint for everything that exists in material form. 
The full equivalence in Einstein's equation, however, comprises far more than matter and energy alone. It also extends to consciousness and love. These four, matter, energy, consciousness, and love, are equivalents, and all four vibrate or they would not exist. Expanding the reinterpreted equivalence equation explains why the presence of love is the key to the success of the afterlife healing circle. Love is both electric and magnetic, giving and receiving, push and pull, attracting. Love, especially love from a person in a physical body with whom the soul is familiar, helps draw the right soul to the circle. Love offers the reassurance that encourages the soul to remain for resolution that usually is much needed on both sides. After death and before birth, consciousness or soul energy, if you prefer, is so intact that even when the physical body is abruptly destroyed, through accident or murder, for example, the remaining self-awareness often doesn't realize what has happened. One example of this is the souls of those killed in the airplane crash for which Jana and Candice considered attempting a soul rescue. An undetected wind shear slammed a jumbo jet violently to the ground just north of the airport runway it was approaching to land. While the physical bodies were removed from the crash site, many of the souls remained for a long time, caught up in that trauma. Consciousness can indeed be oblivious to the destruction of the physical body. This leads to a lot of seemingly strange events that we usually misinterpret and then label as paranormal activity. Hauntings are one example. A soul or group of souls may wander around in a state of confusion, unaware of their physical demise. No longer focused in physical reality, such souls don't have the same sense of the passage of time as do those still dwelling in physical bodies. That's why these souls linger in one location, a house or near a runway, for years or even centuries. Already disoriented or traumatized, these souls become even more bewildered when they realize their families and friends no longer seem to notice them or pay attention when they try to communicate. They may be feeling the extremes of very strong emotions, such as terror or anger. Remember, nothing dies except the physical body. Disembodied souls are as capable of emotions and feelings as anyone reading this page. And it is the energy of very intense emotions that interacts with physical objects, sometimes unwittingly, and at other instances intentionally. Such interactions are known as psychokinesis, which produces phenomena such as phone calls from the dead, apparitions, boat-shaped clouds, or the smell of dirt inside a room where none is evident. These events are often prompted by a soul who very much desires to communicate with someone still in a physical body but who cannot get that person's attention in a less disruptive manner. Often, after someone has passed on to the non-physical, we have thoughts about that person that seem to pop into our heads from nowhere. Or that individual just seems to be on our mind a lot, even though it may have been years since that person died. If more of us realized what was really going on, we would recognize that this supposedly dead and gone person is trying to speak to us. We would also know to talk back. Most of us just brush aside gentle attempts at communication as imaginary, and thus meaningless, or as the effects of lingering grief. The souls trying to break through become annoyed after being ignored. Sometimes they become angry or hostile. Their efforts to elicit attention then take a decidedly more forceful turn. They are desperate to be recognized and addressed. Such was certainly the case with Rebecca. The rare blood type she found on her sheets had no significance to her until she found out that her grandmother, who had passed on some years earlier, had had that blood type. Sure enough, during the afterlife healing circle Jana conducted, Rebecca's grandmother came forward eagerly, just bursting with things she wanted to tell Rebecca. Afterward there were no more blood-stained sheets. The demise of the physical body does not of itself endow a soul with wisdom or ultimate enlightenment. This assertion contravenes extremely ancient and well-entrenched beliefs about life after death that are rooted in many different religious traditions. All of them in their own way state or imply that we attain some sort of improved or possibly perfected state after death, on the condition that we have been good enough, however that particular doctrine defines, good. This belief is also present in academia. Laura Marquard Kirby's thesis from Chapter 2 stated, anything alive is progressively dying. From this perspective death ends the physical dying process and hence can be considered to be a healed state. 3. But as you recall from the previous chapter please re-read it if not souls not in a physical body were hardly healed or enlightened or all-knowing, all-wise. They had issues with those still in body and sometimes expressed their frustration in inappropriate ways, such as continually pestering their parents to be, just as children in physical bodies do. 
When you die, you don't become immediately self-actualized, said Julie Baishal, PhD, director of the Windbridge Institute. She was talking with Angela Artemis, the host of the Powered by Intuition online podcast. She continued, I was surprised to learn that dead people are not scary, because popular culture will lead you to believe they are. They are just people with no bodies, for Julie, who earned her doctorate in pharmacology and toxicology, has learned about the dead through her extensive experiences putting mediums communicating with disincarnate souls through rigorous scientific testing of their accuracy. The stereotype she talks about still prevails, alas. Many people who don't consider themselves formally religious are still secretly convinced that a non-physical being is bound to be enlightened and wise. This is why many such people give undue credence to messages from mediums in a trance state. This stereotype is also why so many people conduct their own impromptu seances, hoping to contact some disincarnate guru or master. They'll contact someone, alright. It's really very easy to communicate with discarnate beings. The problem isn't departed loved ones with whom we share an emotional bond. The problem arises when cosmic curiosity seekers make casual contact with a disincarnate jerk that plays mind games. Or, far worse, they tangle with a denial spirit. Or they inadvertently tune into a soul that would be labeled crazy if it was still dwelling in a physical body. For example, if a person in a mental institution dies while sincerely believing that he is Jesus Christ, his belief is not going to change merely because the physical body has ceased. Although no longer in a physical body, that soul will still believe it is Jesus Christ. And it will be more than happy to convey the words of Christ to anyone willing to pay attention. Consider this from another perspective. Most of us would never open the front door to our homes and yell, come on in, to anyone passing by. Most of us also would not regard a solo walk at 3 a.m. through New York City's Central Park as a very prudent thing to do. Yet people who misuse the seance for casual spiritual voyeurism are doing the equivalent of inviting strangers into their homes and lives or walking alone in the park after dark. Are we saying that all messages from psychics or mediums are from deluded or mentally ill souls or worse? No, mediums and psychics are often helpful, especially when we are having problems trusting or understanding messages from the dead or the not yet born. These difficulties happen all the time because most of us have been taught not to believe or even acknowledge the very spiritual abilities that enable us to communicate with the other side, with soul energy. Let us now review these abilities and their many uses. Soulmate This is a part of Zindagi Ki Roshni Consultancy. It has been established for those who have lost someone and for those who are very sad in their life. About 100 PDF books and 20 short audio books of this topic will be sent to those who join it. This data will be sent to their email or WhatsApp. If you want to join this organization then please send WhatsApp message to this number.